Jerry Seinfeld once said, laughter is the ultimate democracy. The laugh is the vote. What does that have to do with this week's podcast? Absolutely nothing. I just like the quote. (laughs) Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. I'm Amelia Dalton, your host of this here long-standing podcast on eejournal.com. I may be a little giddy this week, my friends. The holidays are coming up. Fish Fry just celebrated its ninth year on air. And I have some amazing quantum technology news to share. So are you ready? Okay, so it's time for a little news you may have missed. Quantum FM radio edition. Oh, yes. Uh, you. <clears throat> oh, yes, you heard me right. Quantum FM radio edition. Now the roar from the crowd is palpable. I can hear all of you loud and clear. Um, Amelia, those two words don't really go together. And my friends, they do. Yes, they do. (laughs) So yes, I'm talking about the future of quantum commercial electronics. You see, my friends, earlier this month, some amazing groundbreaking research was unveiled from the University of Chicago's Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering that should completely change how we view quantum technologies. You see, what? You see why I couldn't wait to say th- <laughs> Now you see why I couldn't wait to share this story. And folks, the answer may have been sitting here the whole time. Okay, now we all know that quantum mechanics have been, so far, plagued with all sorts of different problems. They don't like noisy environments. They are hard to control. They're awfully delicate. But this team from Chicago's Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering found that they can control quantum states when they're embedded in silicon carbide. So if we can take the exotic materials that we used to need to design and build quantum electronics out of the picture and move to silicon carbide, wow. But in this case, it's not just the quantum manipulation that is important. Funny thing, these silicon carbide embedded quantum states also emit single particles of light which just happened to have a wavelength very near to the telecommunication band. Yep, this means that silicon carbide quantum technology could potentially use the very same fiber optic network that transports 90% of today's international data. And even cooler, when these particles are combined with existing electronics, Oh yes, you heard me right. Combined with existing electronics, they gain even more new qualities. This is where that quantum FM radio I mentioned earlier comes in. This team from Chicago's Pritzker School were able to design just that, a way to transmit quantum information over extremely long distances, just like an FM radio would. So apparently this research team wasn't happy with just one major quantum breakthrough. Next, they tackled, maybe on accident, a bit noise. A near universal problem of quantum signals, all signals really, is noise, right? No one likes noise. And it's especially bad for quantum mechanics. And especially that impurity noise, common in all ICs. And quantum signals are just too picky. But this team may have found a way around this noise issue. They found by simply using a diode with this new quantum signal. Well, looky here. The noise almost went completely away. (laughs) Wait, what? So basically, we're combining old school semiconductor technology with this new, strange, sometimes mysterious quantum mechanics and paving the way to quantum reality. Whoa. (laughs) Head investigator on this project, David Auschalom, puts it like this. He says, this work brings us one step closer to the realization of systems capable of storing and distributing quantum information across the world's fiber optic networks. 
Such quantum networks would bring a novel class of technologies, allowing for the creation of unhackable communication channels, the teleportation of single electron states, and the realization of a quantum internet. Now you can see why I could absolutely not wait to tell you guys about this. So if you want even more information about both of these amazing quantum breakthroughs, I've included a couple different links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com. Next up, Gio Lamont from Cadence Design Systems. Please welcome this distinguished engineer, self-professed crazy scientist, and photonics expert. Gio and I are talking all about photonics, y'all. Let's go. Hi, Gio. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Okay, so we're here to talk about photonics today, which is super cool. But, Gio, for my audience who may not know, what kind of application areas are we really looking at for photonics? It actually has been changing recently, and it's been evolving. The core original application was datacom and telecom, you know, the big fiber under the ocean to sure. send your voice. Uh-huh. And it's really been moving into the data centers, primarily or initially through about one kilometer long, but it's actually continuing to move inside much closer for much shorter ranges. That's actually really driving the economics of having more foundries interested in providing photonics, which as a side effect makes it a lot more affordable for different markets Mm. that have not the same price point as those high performance computing. Sure. And that is making a big difference in the applications. For example, we are now seeing for the past two, three years, photonics, you know, startups looking very seriously at machine learning applications. Uh, Light is very good at doing very efficiently multiplication of very large matrices. Yeah. So artificial intelligence, also applications that have always been a little bit strong on there. And the automotive market, right, which is very sensitive from a price point perspective, but the LiDAR, typically you see those rotating LiDARs. There are a lot of startups are trying to get single chip lighters that don't have moving parts. Right. <laughs> and photonics is really a key element in enabling that. Then you have exotic things, right? There is a version of quantum computing which is based on light, mm-hmm. right? So instead of being a matter you know, storing the quantum states, it's light that is used to store the quantum states. There is a lot of computing. So computing with, with light has always been kind of a dream for a lot of people. So I don't know if it's going to be real or not, but there are still a lot of people exploring in, in those areas as well. So broadening, very, very broadening. Mm-hmm. And the last segment is biomedical. Okay. So sensors, chemical sensors. Sure. You know, throw away type of things or lab on a chip. The properties of material in which light is being transmitted is going to be affected by chemicals binding to that thing. And you can use that effect to actually detect, you know, if you're the military, toxic gases. Right. Or if you're more into biosciences, you know, do some DNA sequencing or do some other things like that. So it's a very, very broad range of application, not limited to data processing. Light is analog in nature also. So it is actually very interesting to see all those kind of reaching into the real world application and not just, you know, in the data centers. Right. Okay, so what are the biggest challenges you see as photonics moves into the mainstream? Well, so one of the biggest was the price point. Sure. The fact that the data centers are driving a lot more photonics demand, you know, process demand, is making it more interesting for foundries to get engaged into that. And really, we've seen that happening. And that like I said, is lowering the access point for all the other applications. So that was the biggest, I think, the biggest thing, because there always was in photonics a lot of research in universities. It's been the next science for the next 20 years or right. more, right, ever, right? <laughs> and the biggest hurdle was price point. The second biggest hurdle is interfacing with light, sure. right? So the packaging, yeah. you know, getting the fiber in and out reliably and coupling the light into the chips, yeah. Right. So not losing light. So insertion loss, you know, every time you have an interface between two different material, there is a part of light that gets reflected. 
right? So there's a lot of work that goes on to making sure that those interfaces and those packaging uh, problems are well resolved. Then what's happening, it's not a challenge, it's an evolution, I would say, yeah. is we get people that know that it's affordable and interesting instead of trying to make 10 devices on the chip are starting to say, oh, let me put a hundred or a thousand of those things right. on the chip, yeah. right? So, and it happened, you know, 20 years ago on the electronic as well, right? Right. And, and so this is actually for us then no more into the cadence part, right? Very also exciting from a tool perspective because instead of being able or having to do your design manually, there starts to be a need for automation. Yeah. From a tool perspective, from a basic tool perspective, the first challenge we had was most of the work we've done in the past 20 years was evolving toward the advanced node, right? Right. And getting smaller and smaller and denser. But all of those, all of the time we were doing that was really very uh, much oriented toward a Manhattan 90 degree type of geometries. Right. Light hates 90 degree. You know, <laughs> if you try to make light turn around, it will not, it will not go, right? Right. So we had a first, I would say, infrastructure hurdle to deal with which was to educate our tools to do, you know, curvy linear shapes. There's a lot of mathematics, a lot of things like that. It's not yeah. it's not horribly complicated. For me it's an infrastructure. It's it's the stepping stone, the foundation. But now that we're reaching the point where we have that technology inside the Kedon Soul Virtuoso, we have the demand for a much larger set of design elements, right? Hundreds or thousands even. We are very much into a place where we have to develop new tools, new automation. And this is a real nice opportunity, a challenge as well, right? Because sure. when you start talking about routing, but you're not routing with a 90 degree grid, but it's not even, you know, about 10 years ago, there was things about X and 45. Yeah. This is not even 45. This is any angle, actually circular routing. So, Gio, let's talk a little bit about the tool side of this and what Cadence has to offer. Now, what what do you guys have to help me with my photonics designs? First of all, there's been photonic design being done with the Cadence tools for many, many years. You know, those Datacom chips that have been existing. Sure. But those were mostly the result of individual customers customizing the tools and pushing the tools further than what they were initially designed to do, sure. but have the ability to do. But five or six years ago, we got several of those customers saying, oh, we can't do it ourselves anymore. Please help. <laughs> yeah. Right. And this is really what kicked us into looking into photonics and very proactively starting to engage in, in that domain. And we partnered to some extent with different companies. And today we're still partner and we have a very good partnership with Lumerical, which is complementing our base virtuoso flow in terms of doing the simulation of optical devices. There's been a prevalent methodology that was very spectra-focused using Verilog A modeling. But Verilog A modeling is a mathematical model that is very good, very performant, enables a lot of things, and has totally still has its place, but is also very heavy in terms of maintenance and going into, you know, if you don't have a, an army of PhD in your university available to develop the models for you, right. you have a problem. Yeah. Right? <laughs> in addition, we're seeing much more complex modulation scheme coming in. And instead of just turning on and off the light during basic amplitude modulation of the light, we're seeing, you know, scheme like PAM4 or even much, much higher order. Or you can also modulate the light, take the polarization of the light, change up, and modeling all of those effects in the very log A becomes very complicated. Sure. So this is where numerical modeling, optical modeling, comes as a nice complement to the technology because they have a true optical model. And so we can combine that. And we have demonstrated recently a reference flow for a PAM4 a modulator that does electro-optical true cost simulation. So that's on the simulation side and characterization. No, you need to go into the layout. Yes. Like I told you about two years ago now, we released what we call Curvy Core, which is the ability for the layout tools to deal with non-rectilinear shapes, so mm. curvy linear shapes. Yeah. And that's really the base infrastructure. So that's been the focus for the past year, year and a half of making sure we have the base layer for building automation on top of it. And this is where we are now, right? We have that base infrastructure. We have the ability to run the simulation. We are looking now more at how do we automate? You know, if someone comes to us with a few thousands of photonic components and needs to get the waveguides in between those is how do you automate the routing for that? Right. And, you know, how do you minimize the losses and, and all of those things? The last thing, 
which is really important from a tool perspective and which is, I think, quite unique to Cadence, is photonic chips don't live by themselves. Mm -hmm. True. You need to feed them data and get data in and out. Yeah. Or even on a LiDAR, right? You have a lot of information coming in. You know, the LiDAR is basically just, you know, getting the pictorial information, but someone needs to process that behind it. Cadence has a unique offering, I think, in terms of combining all of that into a system and performing the system level analysis for it. That gets into an interesting point about photonics. Photonic is very heat sensitive. Mm, Yes. Heat is used in photonic to tune photonics. A single degree of tuning can actually make a big difference, nearly to the same amount as as the current we use to modulate the information. Wow, okay. So every single degree is important. So having tools that allow us to make sure the tuning works, so looking at having the dynamic thermal tuning and all of those effects uh, captured during the simulation, but also understanding what happens from a heat perspective when you put that photonic chip in a 2D and a half on an interposer or in a 3D type of situation with a laser next to it, right. which is also a very large source of heat. Yeah. So combining all of that is something that the Cadence tools allow us to do. That vision of doing a full system analysis is really key for enabling system that includes photonics. Okay. Well, Gio, it's time for your off-the-cuff question. Now, you have quite a story on how you came to be at Cadence. So tell me a little bit about your crazy scientist background. Oh, I'm, I'm an electrical engineer, so I'm not a computer science engineer. Okay. And I actually started at Cadence in 1989 as an intern. For, I'm a student from an engineering school in France called ACA, and I did my second internship and my third final project at Cadence. Okay. That's how I ended up being in Cadence. But then I had a very interesting life within Cadence. Okay. I went into Texas. I went into on the East Coast. I lived in Japan for nearly eight years for Cadence, and then in Russia as well. Wow. Helps out the office there. And then I came back here to be a little bit more reasonable in 2003 <laughs> and settle, settle a family. And that's when I actually joined the core R&D team. I was more in talking with customers and more. Cool. Well, as a follow-up question, where was your most favorite place to live in, in all of these journeys? I think I loved very much big cosmopolitan cities. Okay. So both Tokyo and Moscow yeah. were very interesting to me. Here I'm busy with my kids and, and work, right? So right. it, it sort of, it sort of uh, removes the need for entertainment. But I really <laughs> loved living in Tokyo and Moscow. Nice. Well, Gio, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you want to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, well, sure, you can follow us on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash EE Journal. It is chock full of all kinds of super cool techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by yours truly. And remember, if you want any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's fish frying page. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology, any fun EE conference coming up that I absolutely should attend, or even the best geeky hotspot in your city, shoot me a line at amelia at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of December 20th, 2019, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>